in life, you have to have three people that kind of watch your back. A lawyer, an accountant, and a wealth management guy. We're gonna talk about money for the whole segment, but one of the things you do do with your boys that's so cool is that every year you guys have like a Nerf War competition. The real way to create value, whether it's financial and or influence or just multiplying effect on clients, customers, team members, all that, is to think about your business as an asset, not just a job. Do you give kids, your kids allowance? So they get a small allowance, okay, which is just because they're a, a have to work, right? Yeah, just, just like yours. But then they have things that they do we call jobs or gigs. Like if you're not happy, like go find a way to give away some of your your time, your talent, or your treasure, right? There's one tool that doesn't matter whether you have a business or not that I, I it's just my favorite thing, and I think it's the most underutilized tax planning tool. Period. This is the Unleash Your Purpose podcast. All right, well, welcome back to Unleash Your Purpose podcast with your host Ryan Centers. Um, I have a great friend um, and guest today, Caleb Huftelin. Thanks for coming on. Glad to be here. Uh, so those of you who don't know, uh, in life, you have to have three people that kind of watch your back, a lawyer, an accountant, and a wealth management guy. And I got to know Caleb for uh, a, a couple of years and wanted him to be my wealth advisor, but he would not give me the time of day. He would avoid eye contact. We were in a peer group. You avoided eye contact with me. Uh, you would uh, you you'd give all this advice to everyone else, and you would never take me on. I, I don't know if I was too high, too dramatic for you, or or what. What was that? You just have a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, it's really, which is <laughs> which is how you roll. So yes, eventually you're like, like, this guy is going to be complicated. <laughs> and uh, so finally, um, I convinced you to take me on as a client. And now I'm your VIP client. Is That's that right. true? That's the goal. That's the that that is the goal. So uh, yeah, you you're a great godly man. You have a wealth. You own a wealth management firm here in town, but service people all over the country. That's right. And you're like my go-to guy for all things. I mean, I probably call you in urgent things as I'm working on like business deals and how to kind of figure out my like finances and if I'm going to sell a company or how to. Um, be strategic with taxes. Mm -hmm. That feels like that's your bread and butter. Yes, I think tax is the fourth dimension and I like to think in 4D. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good, I like that. And you are the first guest that I actually wore a belt and my glasses because you're a smart guy and I needed to let everyone know that that's how I roll that's with right. people. That's right, I went short sleeves to try to uh, bring balance it, down it out. Like, that's right. Yeah, so you, you opened your wealth management firm a number of years ago um, and you kind of had a cool story behind how you got started farming was involved. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I come from a farming family back okay. in Illinois. And so I grew up multiple generations of, of farming and just got to a point where I really wanted to be in the financial space okay. uh, out, of, out of school. And so uh, kind of did that for a little while, spent some time in Colorado, eight years in Atlanta, and then um, kind of built a practice in Atlanta. And we had two kids at the time. My parents had moved out here to Arizona. And so we said, hey, before we have more kids, and before the business gets too good in Atlanta, let's move, you know, near family. So we came mm -hmm. out here to Arizona in 2014 mm -hmm. and the rest is history. So we just uh, kind of built from the ground up here, building relationships. And you know, now we have two more kids, all, all boys here. And we're just, you know, doing life and loving it here. Yeah. And we're going to talk about money for the whole segment. But one of the things you do do with your boys that's so cool is that every year you guys have like a Nerf war competition. That's right. So you know how to build wealth, but still make really cool memories with your boys, huh? That's the goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we really enjoy that. They've uh, kind of gone through seasons of, of leaning into it. Uh, my dad's got a shed that uh, we just set up for, for Nerf War with all sorts of obstacles and yeah. barriers. And, and so we, we get the dads out there and have fun. That's awesome. So, OK, so you you're my wealth advisor. So you kind of help me with strategic planning for for tax, for li tax liabilities. Um, for what investments to make and how to diversify. As you've been in this space for a decade or more, right? Like what are some of those misconceptions that people come when it comes to wealth and wealth management and what that looks like? Yeah, well, I mean, there's two aspects to that. One is, you know, when you think about having a wealth management person, uh, I think a lot of times we get put in the category of like financial advisor, stockbroker, kind of that old school for sure. version. But I think a lot of uh, a lot of what what I deal with is is tax planning, financial planning, priorities, making sure that the first things are first, mm -hmm. and how how people are executing on on what they've got going on. Um, and so I think the first misconception would just be, hey, it's not just about investments. I mean, investments are are one piece of a huge pie 
of yeah. things that have to be figured out. And I think if you focus too much there, uh, like the old financial advisor kind of category, sure, you'll miss out on all the other opportunities that are easier, lower hanging fruit. Uh, in terms of just wealth building and, and misconceptions there, I think that, um, you know, starting small and, and you know, talking about things that aren't always the most uh, sexy to talk about, yeah. having uh, no, no or low debt, Mm-hmm. It's on the personal side, um, you know, any sort of consumer debt, trying to eliminate that or reduce that, um, having a good good amount of cash, cash ain't trash, you know, just, just so that you can take care of any emergencies, reduce any sort of debt that could come up from that. Mm-hmm. Those are the basics. But I think beyond that, most people try to try to skip ahead and think about, well, how do I um, you get know, my this, return? Yeah, on you get this. this big this big kind of home run. And you have to be able to hit singles and doubles first. Okay. So that's that's a key thing that I've seen people miss uh, throughout the. So they get so excited for what could be on the horizon, but they are kind of tripping over their own feet in the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. So when we first started, you have this really cool platform that you have like all these graphs, and it talks about your financial goals. Yeah. But when we first met, I was very bored because you, because <laughs> I wanted to talk about real estate, how yes. am I get a return? But you're like, hey, Ryan, back up. Let's talk about, okay, how much debt do you have? How much do you guys wanna save? What does it look like for your, your kid's future? All really, really vital things. And it helped me kind of step back and kind of think of wealth management. Is that right word? Wealth management, wealth, yeah. wealth building? Just, just you know, wealth building, wealth yeah. Building, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like from a bigger perspective and thinking almost like it from like a legacy perspective. Like we got nine kids and actually 11 kids, but we, as you think about that, like what does um, their life look like and making sure that they're set up for success, not trust fund babies or trust fund kids, but mm-hmm. they really are like disciplined. They understand what it means to for hard work, but also like making sure they have assets to go to because I'm trying to develop this family that can continue on for generations. So it's almost like my, my mindset has been shifting, especially being around you is like, wealth is generational and hopefully you're setting up like generational wealth for your and that you can impact god's kingdom and set your family up and that's like your bread and butter it seems like yeah when you think about like everybody kind of jokes about hey i'd like to my last check to bounce you know before i pass away (laughs) like literally the the odds of that happening are basically zero so there is some sort of legacy whether it's you know small or big but one of the things that we talk with some of our clients about is you know wealth cannot by itself create wisdom Hmm. But wisdom may have the ability to create wealth. Okay. And so we talk about the idea of transferring wisdom before wealth so that you kind of align with that that principle, if you will. So when you're thinking like wisdom, like is that kind of thing about for yourself, like learning the principles before that, or especially with your kids too, is laying that foundation with your kids to know how to transfer that wealth over? Both. But I, I think specifically I'm thinking of uh, transferring wisdom, you know, to the kids, right? And yeah. Helping them understand concepts. like. I'll give you an example. So we have four boys. They range from five to 12. Okay. And from pretty early age, we've had kind of this, this methodology of we prioritize giving, saving, and living. Mm-hmm. We've had percentages we have si- assigned to that. So all our boys have gone through that. But then I thought, what, what else can we do besides just you know allocating money? Because that's just, you know, someday a spreadsheet can handle that for you, right? So for your kids, let me ask. So for me, we, we've been all over the map of giving kids allowance. No, you're just like centers. This is your duty as a citizen of this household do you want to live here okay here's your chores do you give kids your kids allowance so they get a small allowance okay which is just because they're a, a huftalin right yeah just, just like yours um but then they have things that they do we call them jobs or gigs okay. where they can earn extra money so if you know okay. the oldest is watching or the older two are watching the other yeah. two for for a little bit while we go on a hike down the road you know they get five bucks or something right yeah, so just yeah. something so that it's a little bit extra mm-hmm. um but most of the time we just do the the the, basically there's chores they do just because they're part of the family and there's allowance they get a very small allowance just because yeah. they're part of the family we want to give them a little bit of ability to, to spend some money um, on, on normal life things but sure. then if they want to buy something bigger or do a bigger experience then that's going to have to come from the jobs the gigs or yeah. money they might get from birthdays or Christmas that's good there's even I my older two have this app where they have it like a debit card mm-hmm. and you can put into their like how much they have to put in savings, how much they give, and then you can assign jobs to them. Mm-hmm. So on their phones, like, all right, you can go wash the car and earn 10 bucks or something like that. And it's like a modern day way of like teaching that responsibility. Yep. And it, yeah, it seems it's it seems like it's been working pretty well. 
But I, yeah, I've been really wrestling with like, how do I train up my kids? Because I, when I was a kid, I love my mom, but I don't think she didn't really teach me much in regards to like financial management. It was all through osmosis, just kind of watching her mm-hmm. kind of do it. Yep. But now I'm like, my kids need to have it. Like I need to welcome them into the business and show them like, all right, this is how we do it. So we're like, even as simple as we have backyard chickens. All right, how much does it cost for us to buy the food? How much does it cost for the carton of eggs? All right, it costs us this much money. Uh, we get this many eggs a day. How much do we have to sell it for? Mm-hmm. So it's like teaching them tiny little principles that is like, oh, and now we're, we'll watch Shark Tank. And they always say, like, I don't want to watch Shark Tank. I'm like, no, you're going to watch Shark Tank. And they ask all about the percentages. Well, how much is this worth, Dad? How much is this worth? <laughs> and I'm like, you're getting ahead of yourself here. But but it's really fun to see that their light bulbs start turning on with those things. Yeah, and I think sometimes we think we have to overcomplicate this whole process. For for me, it's like, what am I learning? What am I experiencing? And you know how it's, you don't really understand something until you can teach it. Mm-hmm. So what I've tried to do is say, okay, if there's a really big concept that I'm grasping, yeah. I want to be able to, to break it down to a level where they understand. Sure. So example of that is, we talk about, you know, how do you how do you make money? Just how do you make money? And, and the initial answer is, well, you, you go to work, right? You, you right. Go to, and, and that is true. But then I take it deeper and I say, okay, well, what is it that they're doing at work? And so mm. ultimately it comes down to value creation, right? right? It doesn't matter whether it's an entertainer or somebody who's saving somebody else time or literally, you know, trying to, you know, for us, it's help people minimize taxes, or whatever. Like we're creating value right. for, you know, whoever we're serving. And that's what, how we get paid, right? And so what I've tried to do is communicate that concept to them, but also help them see when somebody's making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. For example, like one of my boys right now is really into to, uh, David Beckham, right? So he's, yeah. he loves, so I was like, I tried to connect, what did he do to create value so that he could, you know, have all this, this money now, right? And, yeah. and these, and if he owned like part of the, like the Miami. Yeah. 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 And so we, we, we connected the dots between, hey, ultimately he created value sure. for, for teams he played for, mm-hmm. the advertisers that he served because he drew eyeballs to himself, basically. Yeah. Right. And that was his way to create value. That's probably not the best example because the entertainer is just hard. Well, they're just out there having fun. But you can connect it to any anybody who's earning money out there. They're creating value for an organization or their clients. Yeah. So that concept is just, is just helpful to really, for me, connect those dots for them so that they can start thinking. I don't want them to think that they just have to go out and as long as they work hard, it'll work yeah. out. If they really want to go make a difference, whether it's actually being influential or um, you know, just living out their purpose or just making lots of money. Like if that's a you know goal yeah. that they could have, sure. I want them to see how you do that. Right. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. It, it, that's probably a miss uh, for a lot of parents and even like, like understanding because the, the most common question is like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's, that's very like shallow when it comes to this day. Like, yeah, the, maybe there is value of saying that, but like, th- what is the impact that you want to make? Um, what makes, what not just make your heart happy, but, um, what's broken in this world that needs to be fixed and okay. What value can you bring? Like mm-hmm. that's, I mean, that's, that's the basics of honestly business is like, where's the problem? How can you step in and engage that problem and provide either better service, better product yep. and make it happen? Yeah. So that's what I pray for our, my boys. And I don't pray for an amazing job. I pray yeah. for them to, to find their ultimate purpose okay. and, and be able to add value to the world. That's great. So you're you're the tax guy. You said, okay, I see in 4D. <laughs> so like, and your whole firm is about ha- maximizing the tax code, which is, I mean, this thick and changes every year. It seems like, right? Yeah. And we we'll get on calls with my CPA and you and uh, talk about different scenarios and situations. Like, what are some of these tax strategies that are kind of foundational? that you like to, the lenses that you think through? Yeah, well, first, I think that it's good to, to, to know that like taxes are a symptom of success. So first of all, you should celebrate that you're paying taxes. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, right. it's, yeah, I know it's hard, it's hard <laughs> to do that, but like, let's move past that quickly. Yeah. Um, but then from there, it's like, okay, to be, um, you know, wise, how do we minimize that obligation in every, every, every legal way that's possible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's lots of ways you can, you know, do some research or, you know, Google, but you know some of the things that I see that are actually missed yep. uh, that you you could find on a list somewhere, but most people's eyes most people's eyes just glaze over when they see them. But I mean, and it depends. Like if you have a, a business, you have more tools in the tool bag to help with that, right? That's true. Um, there's one tool that doesn't matter whether you have a business or not that I, I it's my favorite thing, and I think it's the most underutilized 
tax planning tool, period, especially for those who are generous, who, who give to charity, church, mm-hmm. uh, organizations around the world. Uh, and that's the donor advised fund. Okay. Uh, so, you know, basically it's a, it's a think about it like an account that when you put money into it, uh, you get a deduction, just like if you gave to a charity. And, and then from there, you can decide where it goes. As long as it goes to a charity, um, it, you know, ultimately has to end up in the, in the hands of a 501c3 charity. But by doing that, there's a couple of things that happen. One, you can control the timing of the deduction, even mm-hmm. if you're not ready to distribute that out to the, the, the charity. So you can do it in large chunks um, or, you know, in, in some ways you can you can do that, you know, a year ahead of when you actually think you'll give the money out. So you get the deduction mm-hmm. uh, when you're accelerated. But the more important thing is, you know, as as you build wealth, uh, either just in, in life in general or if you've got a business or you start creating some investments that, uh, that start growing in value, ultimately you've got stuff that's, you know, that's worth more than you paid for it. And mm-hmm. so someday, like what the IRS wants, they're going to get their money somehow. So they, they say, if you're going to sell that, you've had growth, you've had increase in that right. value. So we want it, we want some, some taxes on that set that, uh, that we're going to collect. So one way, you know, to, to utilize a donor advice fund is actually, you know, transfer some of those assets, whether it's stock, uh, ETF, mutual fund, uh, even part of a business into a donor advice fund. And by doing that, um, you know, that's typically a 501c3 that doesn't pay tax. Uh, and in most cases, they don't pay any tax on that, even if they sell the asset inside the mm. donor advised fund. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot, lot more to it and some nuances. But I think that's one tool that if you ever hear that word, donor advised fund yeah. or DAF, um, you know, explore it a little bit and see how yeah. it can be utilized for your situation. I mean, you helped me set up my DAF mm-hmm. this last year, like the Centers Giving Trust. And it was one of the things for us was like one simplicity sake that you're we are able to give to this fund and then give out the money. So you get one tax, one statement every mm-hmm. year, which is very nice. Yep. Very like you have all these papers all over when you go to file your taxes. Oh wait, didn't I give to that school? Did I do this? You just get one statement. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you had some other strategies for us. Was like I pre-funded a lot of the the fund and to kind of help with some catch up, but also to help with like appreciation and things like that. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit outside of my scope in regards to like my financial acumen as I'm like learning and growing in this, but there's some tax advantages to doing that. Is yeah. That- Part of it is accelerating, you know, getting deductions sooner than you sure. otherwise would. So that's helpful. That's time value money working, working right. for you. Um, and then just over time doing that with, like I said, funding it with appreciated assets instead of cash. Yeah. Most people don't realize as you, as you build wealth over time, one of the worst assets to give is cash. Okay. So just think about that and be like, okay, why is that? And what are some other ways that I can do it? Uh, and that's so there's better ways to do it from a tax standpoint. Yeah. So instead of like waiting to get my paycheck and then I say, okay, I give my tithe or I give my, uh, give to this orphanage that we um, take care of or something like that. You're saying if I can, maybe I have a rental house. So I could have a paid off rental house. I could gift that into the DAF. You could. Yep, okay. absolutely. And there's there's obviously nuances with, with sure. stuff like that. It's it's harder if you have debt on it and uh, sure. you know, some other things. But in theory, yes, you could. And and so then you know that that house can be sold to any buyer uh, that would that would want to buy it. Right. And then those proceeds just stay in your donor advised fund. Okay. And you can control typically where that goes. You know what charities it goes out to. Uh, and could that be in? Does that money accrue interest and in, it can investment? It can, investment? it can be invested in almost any way you can think about investing uh, mm. in a traditional portfolio. So that's like number one is to get a DAF. Is, yeah, is to or to explore that. Explore it. Yep. Especially it, if you're wanting to live a life of generosity. Like for us, for the centers, one of our core values is like we are generous. So we constantly are trying to harp that into the the kids and. Um, like even for our, for, we're excited for like our, for, my 40th birthday, we're going down to, we go down to Rocky Point with a bunch of friends, but instead of just partying it up, we're saying, all right, everyone is coming to the party. We're going to the, our orphanage and staying there for a day and doing a big service project. And for us, it's like trying to help ingrain these moments of, of service and generosity but this is just a, a tool to kind of help be intentional with that. Yeah, and you think about it. So a lot of times, generosity or giving is is leftovers. Yeah, you know, unless you you know, prethink it or have a plan sure. for it. So, you know, the way I think about it is is generosity. You want to move towards it being planned, priority, percentage, and progressive. Okay. So if you're moving towards that, mm-hmm. uh, and and you utilize, for example, the DAF to help kind of keep track of it all. Yeah you're probably moving in the right direction. 
And and why it matters is is I mean number one, you know we're we're, we're basically stewards of of money mm-hmm. and wealth, right? So ultimately we have to decide, you know, who owns it all, right? right? And so one way that we show that we're just stewards and not owners ourselves, we're we're managing that in trust for you know for God's purposes is to make it you know priority and planned and percentage and you yeah. know, I think over time you develop maturity by making it progressive as well. Yeah, and that's probably like prob. I mean, if for those who maybe don't have a Christian perspective or are not as far along maybe in their their Christian their their faith journey, like seeing, understanding what stewardship is, and probably the thing that our culture and we hold on to is, that so tightly is money, mm-hmm. right? And I would even say for me, as my maybe as my wealth has gotten greater, the numbers of giving has gotten greater, and it gets it gets harder. It's harder. Yeah, as the numbers get bigger, the giving gets bigger, but it's like, wow, I could do what with all of that? But it's you're right. It's like, but I have to go back to my life is not mine. My kids are not mine. They are God's. This money that God has given me is not mine. The business is not mine. It's all the Lord's. And if this is all the Lord's, I have to 100% just surrender it over and say, all right, I want it. It's yours and do with it. Mm-hmm. And every year trying to get into the discipline of raising the percentage every year that it gives. And like, we have a goal, we have a spreadsheet. He's made me get into spreadsheets, guys. This is next level. I don't like it, but I'm getting used to it. And you have all of my income and the percentage goal and ramping it up every year and the numbers get bigger. And your goal is to help me make more money so we can give more money away. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing is, even if even if you don't give because of you know, hey, it's 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 kind of a uh, a faith based reason. Sure. You know, the studies have shown that contentment, the one of the yeah. best ways to increase contentment, joy, just happiness in life is yeah. is generosity. And so, you know, like if you're not happy, like go find a way to give away some of your your time, your talent, or your treasure. Right. If you can do that, I think that ultimately that will again increase your maturity and contentment uh, mm-hmm. just in the way that you handle in life. Yeah, we, uh, that's so true. Like I was watching, like we took a bunch of our kids um, at Ohana. We took 200 foster kids and special needs adults to to Williams in Arizona for a camp. And their joy on their faces was just the most beautiful thing. For me, it was like heaven on earth, like watching these kids dance and jump around and um, experience just love and be kids. And that, that thing, thing was, was not cheap to do, um, but the impact was so significant. And what I absolutely loved is I watched um, my ki- So I had my kids, um, they were in charge of the sound booth mm. and lightings and they took, so when we had our large group, they were on point. The lights were just perfect. When someone comes on stage and they were ready and they're like, all right, dad, what time we gotta get there? And they get the music and it's like, you know first first session or two a little clunky Mm. but but by uh our third or fourth small group man or our large group it was so dialed in and they were so happy and fulfilled and to me it's like they were giving their time yeah and their and they i watched their confidence build so it's like helping my kids see the value of that and for people to experience that is one of the most humbling amazing things for sure yeah well and and they they not only have heard you talk about it but they're seeing it and then they're yeah. getting involved in it so it's building that muscle and that habit 100 percent. that it you know that, that kind of thing could stay with them forever for sure so like it so thinking back to kind of financial say you're what would be you said obviously a daf is one strategy for obviously reducing taxes but regardless of you like say you're just starting off on like this idea of wealth management mm-hmm. you're saying what are you, you kind of said what the, some of the things are obviously controlling your debt and your expenses. Um, what are some other areas that are some disciplines and maybe strategies that regardless of your financial like means at this moment that you could start moving towards? Yeah. Well, there's, there's something, and we work with people, uh, you know, of, of basically all levels of wealth, sure. you know, um, and one of the things that's just fascinated me is how overcomplicated we try to make it across mm. the entire spectrum. And, you know, part of part of the industry that I come from, the reason they 
you know, they, they had a job was because they made it complicated, right? Yeah. Financial advisors. If you and, don't understand it, then you're not going to question them, right? Right. And so yeah. I think it's kind of like, was it Mark Twain that said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter yeah. kind of thing. And so I think 100%. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is, is help people understand that it doesn't have to be complex to be effective. And so uh, one of the ways that I, I've helped clients frame, frame that is, you know, rather than worrying about like, okay, investing is, is green and not investing is red, like, yeah. like, if, if we think about investing, it, it can get like, okay, how, what funds do I use? Which stocks do I buy? Mm -hmm. What type of account do I use? All that stuff. Yeah. And there's ways you can learn and you should learn about how to do that the most advantageous, you know, whether it's taxes right. or whatever. But the reality is, if you just think about um, two, two time frames, it, it can be very simple. So if you are, if you're saving money or setting aside money for something that you're probably going to use it for in the next three to five years, okay. that should not be invested. In the, in the traditional terms, like don't think about investing that into so the short term goal. Yeah, it's a, short -term like a big goal. anniversary trip. So we're going to go to Europe. Yep. So base case there should be it's in cash. I mean, you can look at high yield, you know, savings accounts yeah. or money, whatever. That's fine. But base case is it should be in cash because you cannot take risk with that. You have a plan for that in the next mm -hmm. three to five years. You could get lucky and have it do better than cash yeah. doing something else. But in general, I think it's just your base case should be let's let's do cash or something very cons you know conservative like bonds, right? Or just it should be very conservative. But when you have something that's three to five years out or more, mm -hmm. you can even make a case for you know five years plus. That's that's ripe for for truly doing investing. Okay. And um, you know I think too there you don't have to overcomplicate it. I, I I truly believe you could do really good investing with with just one fund one diversified fund or etf or you know mutual fund however you want to do, maybe not an individual stock necessarily yeah. but you know don't let that complexity of what you think it should be prevent prevent you from actually just getting started and and deploying it and moving on i was listening to one guy he's a, an investor he was almost making the point he's really making pitches for people to get to cash out their ira and put them into real estate portfolios and real estate funds good idea risky can't it's difficult to make a kind of determination on stuff like that yeah well i mean i think you have to go back to what was the reason for the ira to start with typically yeah. you know i'd say a traditional ira you, you put the money into it and most retirement. off the time yeah for retirement and it's yeah. it's you, know, you got a deduction and so if you take that money out it might be taxable plus if you do it before age 59 and a half in that case it would also have a penalty on top of it right so even if you get amazing, you know, returns on, on real estate, which is, you know, you have to be really good at it to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be worth it because of how little capital you have left after paying the taxes. Right. And and now, could you do a real estate uh, investment trust or something inside of, or have a real estate focus inside of it instead of an IRA? You you can actually. Yeah. So um, that's probably more of a nuance type of like. Yeah. There's some reason that they're recommending that. Yeah. Versus they, like, what was the original purpose? Uh, there's a lot of times where maybe if you have an IRA and you could use that fund, use that money for real estate, but it has to be completely passive. You can't have yeah. any control and it's not for, it may be getting a better investment return, but you're not getting, you still can't get it till retirement right? without getting the penalty. Yeah. Those are, those are kind of interesting approaches. The bigger thing is, you know, understanding, have you have you maxed out all the opportunities you can? So whether it's IRA, Roth, 401k, sure. you know, I think first you look at the tax aspect of how that's going right. to be set up and then and then you figure out which investments inside of it. Right. But again, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah, it's I think there's probably a tricky thing with today's world is that you see something on TikTok, you see a tax strategy, you see and maybe it's just my feed that shows all of this. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Have I ever sent you a TikTok that says, can I do this? You have. You I did have. send me one. <laughs> and you're like, Ryan, maybe. <laughs> but yeah. let's get on a call. <laughs> we, we, we ended up doing it, but in some format. You can't, couldn't do it the way they described it exactly. Yes, yes. And it, it, yeah, it is very effective. And um, so sometimes it does come, but you need to have a wealth advisor that knows way more than a 30 second TikTok. That's right. Is that true? <laughs> yes. Oh, man, I am difficult. So one thing I wanted to sh that you've been super instrumental for me is I have this. You kind of helped me as I'm very entrepreneurial and I'm a ser I've, I would always claim myself I'm a serial entrepreneur where I always have an idea and I would always want to immediately take action. My action is like my drug of choice and it creates a very long to do list. 
Um, it's very exciting, but it's also very, um, it's probably not the most healthy thing as I have am maturing as a person. So that comes to where you were a little skittish of taking on me as a client is because my portfolio of businesses was just so diverse. Diverse. <laughs> yes. Diverse is a good word. And I felt like the Lord recently was telling me that I have to narrow my focus to broaden my impact. I had this year, um, at the end of last year, the impact that Ohana was having and that God was doing through Ohana was just so significant. And that's my life. Like I can't discount that. And I have all these other companies around that I enjoy that are passion projects, uh, but are not being maximized to their potential. Mm -hmm. And I, in December of this last year, November, I called you, I said, Hey, I think I have to sell sky zone. And you, I mean, you and I have went to sky zone a dozen times. We love it. Like our kids go jump, we have a good time. And uh, that was a really hard thing to work through. But you asked me some really good questions of like long-term planning, like what do you want? And like how, yeah, you're just really instrumental for that. I think one of them was, you know, and thinking about the concept, like the longer you think about a decision, that like the longer time frame out you play that out, mm -hmm. the easier and the better decision you make today. Okay. So if you if you run scenarios and you say, ultimately, is this you know is this a you know a five year type of thing or a ten year? But the longer you can play that out in reality, yeah, the easier that decision is today. And I remember that being when you said that, I, I think it just fell into place. So you're like, I want to narrow my focus to broaden my impact. And then we talked about well, well, long term, what has the bigger impact for you? Yeah. Oh, it was just a slam dunk. Right. And then you were thinking like, and for me, even from like a like a, a time and a calling thing was a, was probably the 90%, 80% of it, is that I can't do everything, like I can't do everything and do it great. I can do a bunch of stuff okay, but in order to be great is it, I had to narrow my focus. So it's like time and calling. Another interesting thing that you, were, you said is the amount of time and money that I, the return I'm getting necessarily on this business, if I actually use that money in my core business that I'm really talented at, which is Ohana, it's real estate, like that return is way better. Mm -hmm. And you actually got out the spreadsheet yet again <laughs> and just said, let's just walk through this, uh, this decision versus this decision and which one's going to get the better return and which one's going to be less drama for your life. Yeah. Yeah. And it sometimes just takes people like you to say like, Hey, uh, let's walk through this. Don't mm -hmm. be an idiot. <laughs> well, you know, in some ways, like for you, you, you get excited about new and different things yes. and, and you like that diversity of, 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 you know, just thinking about different options. But I think one of the things we also talked about was, well, what if you could take that creativity inside of your focus, right? Use right. that, but, but it's still within an area that you have a lot that like you know really well, you've had success, uh, historically, and so by doing that, you're able to just channel that 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 creativity in the right way. Yeah, that was probably a game changer for me. It's like, how, yeah, exactly. How do I take this superpower, but it it can turn into an Achilles heel? Mm -hmm. Like, because I'm just doing so many different things, marketing for three different companies and different trying to, the customer acquisition costs are different for membership for a gym versus trying to get 7,000 people in a trampoline park versus maintaining a relationship with the state for, you know, it goes on and on and on. And your brain can only go T -t 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 so often before you're just not great at anything. Yeah. And it can work. I've seen it yeah. work if you're completely passive, right? Yes. So, so can I compare this to like a, an investment portfolio, right? Diversification is good in investment portfolio, but you have a ton of, it's, passive you have no control over those organizations or those mm -hmm. funds or whatever you're investing in and it doesn't really distract you well it's diversification intelligently mm -hmm. versus when you have something where you're putting your blood sweat and tears into it being more focused can be helpful from that standpoint yes another thing to think about is <laughs> this wasn't isn't necessarily your problem uh that i've seen so it far was <laughs> <laughs> but in the evolution of just you know building wealth um being wise being a good steward mm -hmm. a lot of people uh 
may think of like a side gig or a business mm -hmm. and think about it in terms of income, right? So if I do this thing, yeah. it's, it's an income for me. And it's, it's good. Like, that's good. We want to be creative and, and solve problems ultimately, like we talked about earlier. But I think one of the things that's been challenging me lately is thinking about the real way to create value, whether it's financial and or influence or just multiplying effect on clients, uh, customers, mm -hmm. team members, all that, is to think about your business as an asset not just a job. Good. So when you make decisions that, you know, optimize just the income that that you're looking at, you might make it a little bit different than if you look at that business as, hey, the value that's being created here is actually some multiple of that mm -hmm. income. And um, obviously you, you have to do it strategic over the long term. But by doing that, uh, I think you change your your mindset totally. from just thinking about job to to actually creating value that that ultimately pays you for the wealth that you create instead of just the work that you do. That's good. Yeah, I, I was actually just in a, a mastermind group um, with a bunch of guys who are business owners, are trying to integrate their business and their life together. And it's different. Their their transition is like not, you want to think of assets over careers. Assets over careers. So trying to create generational wealth for your family for the long term. And that's through real estate, business, investments, that can continue to leave a legacy. And when you're thinking about like a multiple, it's like probably developing, a, as you develop a business and working on the business, you may have to shave off some profitability to fix the processes and systems. So for us in our, our gyms, maybe our profitability is being impacted right now, but we're really like scaling up our membership process from a, from a lead who comes in the door or a lead that comes from online to getting them in the door for a great experience. That costs investment of training, of making sure we have the right people, paying people better. And that may affect the bottom line slightly, but those percentages of that conversion is has been going through the roof. Hmm. And then when I say someday wanna sell this, that multiple that you're talking about is worth so much more. Mm -hmm. Like, oh wow, man, you're converting at 40% versus this industry average of 27% that's worth another multiple, mm -hmm. like versus being sold at three times, EBITDA, you're at three times. Mm -hmm. And that's that's an asset that doing that work and that hard creative stuff in the business is probably gonna be very helpful for that long term. Yeah, and understanding the, the dashboard of levers you can pull. Mm -hmm. So that right there gives you, not only you control over uh, profitability or just growth versus maximizing current operations, you know, if you think about what levers can you pull so that when you open another location or another business or add another team member, yeah. how do you how do you maximize their their potential as well? Yeah. But your your wisdom for me is in your job, I'm telling you now, so everyone can hear it in the world, is to could you say, Ryan, narrow your focus, broaden your back. Because I mean, I'm sitting at our winter camp with hundreds of kids like that are trying to help be make them great humans. That's a big impact. And you got to do that with amazing like excellence. Mm -hmm. And there's lots more creative ways I can make this better and do that. But I need to continue to narrow, narrow, narrow. <sighs> I don't like it. <laughs> but throwing right. pains is a good thing. Yeah. Well, and there is the, like an arc of just how you go about things, right? I mean, sure. your story is is just amazing to see what, what growth has happened. Sure. Right. But everybody has kind of this arc, you know, and it might be a hockey stick or it could be a situation where it's more of an arc that kind of comes back down in terms of focus. Right. And maybe that's what you're experiencing right now yeah. is being able to have that to where the, the, the multiplication is, is more like a laser, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to just a... And even as I'm doing this, rock. like I just was talking to my... I, we started this podcast late because I showed up late. <laughs> what a classic. <laughs> I showed up late, but because I was in a really good meeting about a partnership that is so like exactly what I've been dreaming for Ohana. And I've been fighting to get this ha to happen for two years. And honestly, it's like now starting to emerge and it's going to be so good for our kids, a huge financial lift. And Yesterday, I get a call from the city wanting to do some kind of project together. And these are things I'm not even pursuing. And it just starts to like, I think that's the, 
like from a, my spiritual lens, it's like, all right, this is me being faithful to what I'm called to do right now. And like, it's God's honoring that. Um, or just I'm putting in the work and over time, here comes the fruit of it. Mm-hmm. So those are the good little reminders of the important stuff. So uh, the last question I ask every one of my guests, um, we could talk through tax strategy again, more in depth, but uh, you as a business person, as a dad, like at the end of your life, um, what do you want to be remembered for? Well, I mean, I, uh, several years ago, I, I wrote out this whole epitaph basically of kind of what I want uh, and tried to narrow it down to what would be on a tombstone. But really, uh, and I do review it every, every so often. Um, but I think I would, I would kind of highlight the fact that like, ultimately I want people to look at me and say, okay, they, he was, he followed Christ and he ultimately inspired others to want to do that as well and, and mm. do it well. Um, and so like for me, number one, it's my family, uh, my boys, uh, there'll be nothing greater than seeing them follow Jesus forever. And ultimately I think that, uh, the impact comes from, you know, literally just doing that day in and day out the best that I can. I'm, I screw it up all the time for sure. But by doing that, I think, you know, my goal is just to hear, you know, well, well done, good yeah. and faithful servant. Ooh, that's good. It's a hundred percent true. All right, man. Well, thank you for, for coming on and, um, yeah, we'll have to do it again very soon. Yeah, enjoyed it. All right. So until next week, may you unleash your purpose so you can profit in business, faith, and life. See you next time. Thanks for joining us for the Unleash Your Purpose podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review. We'll see you next week.